we'll start from there. <laughs> anyway, this is Revelation 1, 4 through 6. <clears throat> to the seven churches in the providence of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and was and is to come, and from the seven spirits before the throne, <clears throat> and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witnesses, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has released us from our sins by his blood, who has made us to be a kingdom priest to his God and Father. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. So be it. So I want to say before I start that we are all parts of the body. So I thank each and every one of you who went down to the journey, and I thank each and every one of you who participated and did part in the service here as well. Have you been reading your morning devotional or whenever your devotional is? Am I on? You just turned me down? Okay. I don't know if you read this morning's or not, but boy, it was right on target for where we're at today. Psalm 119, 49 to 56, Remember your word to your servant, for you have given me hope. My comfort in my suffering is this. Your promise preserves my life. The arrogant mock me unmercifully, but I do not turn from your law. I remember the Lord, your ancient laws, and I find comfort in them. Indignation grips me because of the wicked who have forsaken your law. Your decrees are the theme of my song wherever I lodge. In the night, Lord, I remember your name, that I may keep your law. This has been my practice. I obey your precepts. And he goes on to say, the word and the culture. It is difficult to believe in a culture in which people mock you for believing in God's truth. Why should anyone be concerned for antiquated or ancient laws that are clearly outdated? Verse 52. Despite this cultural scorn, the psalmist holds on to the word re resolutely. Verses 51 and 52. The result is a life preserved, verse 50. Everywhere God's word is, is said to preserve life. And while in some cases that might mean literal survival, here it means more. The Bible creates endurance. It promises, its promises lift the heart and, it, and its panoramic insight strengthen the will. It, is, it truly is spiritual manna that keeps us on our feet and able to go on. Now, if that's not reading from Revelation, then I don't know what it is, but that's from the psalmist so many years before that. And as you're reading Revelation, I want you to think about our endurance, whether we're suffering like they were in the early church, or if we're just enduring through political times and through complacency, and whatever those things are, that we're supposed to endure by being good stewards of God's Word, by applying it into our lives, being set apart, living holy lives, training up our children, and given the opportunity, telling people of the hope we have. That is why we are still here. If that wasn't the purpose anymore, we would all be in glory. Until we are in glory, we are to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Saying that, I want you to think about that more and more as you read Revelation, and I'll explain more after I pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you, for you are the one who is worthy of all glory and praise and honor. And that you would choose to love us is just beyond anything that we can possibly imagine. The things that you have in store for us are indescribable, unexplainable, and I can never even begin to fathom them. And we have a job in the meantime to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. As he gave up heaven and came and suffered and died for us, what difference does it make the light and momentary suffering that we may have? And Lord, when we're not suffering, Lord, help us to not be complacent, but to use that time to be a time when we can be the hands and feet and tell others of Jesus Christ while we have the opportunity without suffering. Lord, as we read Revelation, let us see the hope that we have, that we know that regardless of the things that are going on in this world, that we know that our hope is securely grounded in Jesus Christ. 
Open up our eyes and ears to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Help us to hear and obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I entitled this, Saved Through Tribulation. And Merle read Revelation 1 through 6. He has made us to be a kingdom of priests for his God forever. Priests, a kingdom of priests. We belong to the kingdom of heaven, not to the kingdom of this world. We are joined together as priests, priests who offer sacrifices acceptable to God. I'm thinking of Romans 12, and yeah, I pop out Bible verses when I'm going along and think of these things. That we're even to present our, our bodies as a living sacrifice. We are here together to make petitions to God for people who aren't saved and for people who are saved. It's our duty to be a kingdom of priests. Saying that, verse 1 of Revelation 1 says, This is a revelation of Jesus Christ. This is not John's words. This is a revelation, one revelation, not a bunch of revelations, of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his who? His servants what must soon come to pass. And we know that God's timing isn't what our timing is, so we don't concentrate on the soon come to pass. Verse 3 says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and obey what is written, because the time is near. Then we'll get to, to the verses that Merle read. So blessed are you if you read, these, the, read aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and obey what is written. For because the time is near. Now as you're thinking about this, instead of thinking about all the end times and the way things are going to happen and whether there's pre, pre mid or post rapture and tribulation and all that, think about who you are in Jesus Christ. You're his servants, you're his hands and feet, you're the priesthood. That's what you're called to do regardless of the situations that's going on in the world around you. You're his hands and feet and you are his voice in this world. And you are blessed because of your right position with God. So I have to go back when I see that word blessed, and I have to go back to the Beatitudes in Matthew and Luke. And I have to concentrate more on those blessings than I do on figuring out these things in Revelation. Or I'm never going to get the point that I'm to be those hands and feet of Jesus Christ regardless of what's going on out here. Those things that we concentrate so much on in the book of Revelation, trying to figure these things out, and everybody that's got the answer is a 100% is a, uh, firm believer that their answer is correct, but yet they are so divided in all their answers. And they're an expert. So is everyone else. Don't worry about trying to figure out these things. This letter was written as a revelation from Jesus Christ to John to tell seven real churches to persevere and keep up the good work in which they were doing, and he corrects them in the work they're not doing. Because the time is coming when you won't be able to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ anymore. There won't be any opportunity to tell anyone else about the love that you have. There won't be any, any more opportunity to reach out and offer the gospel presentation so someone might accept it and be saved. The next time is the time of God's wrath. When the sheep and the goats are separated, go back and read the gospel of Luke, the gospel of Matthew, whatever it is, and look at those words. The risen Jesus is preparing a place for us, and he sends out this letter after he has gone to heaven to tell these seven churches about what's going on because they are struggling in the world with their faith and with their lives, and they're being persecuted. There are consequences for being a kingdom of priests. Satan wants to kill, steal, and destroy. And he has no power or authority over you because you belong to the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Verse 16 of chapter 1 says, And a sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth. That's Jesus. His face was like the sun shining at his brightest. Are you reading and studying God's Word? That's why I ask you, first of all, if you read today's devotion, because it is dead on the money of where it should be. It's not coincidence that we read that devotion today, and we're here in Revelation, and I couldn't have planned it that way if I tr had to, that we'd be re reading these words in Revelation now, and that um, devotional will come up. And we read His Word and study His Word because we know what we're going to be transformed into. The likeness of Christ here on this earth and forevermore. So He's the one with a sharp double-edged sword coming from His mouth and His face 
was, was shining, the sun was like the sun shining at its brightest. So we study God's Word. We don't just read it, we study. We come together, we uplift each other. We come together with the gifts that we have. And this weekend was a beautiful example of that in this building here and in that building down there. How we came together as the body of Christ and we each served where we felt called to serve. Are you studying? I continually with our Awana's program dr drill that verse into them. 2 Timothy 2, 15. Study or work hard to prove yourself, study to, to show thyself an approved workman that needeth not to be ashamed, that rightly divides the word of truth. I get confused if I don't go back with the one that I learned. That we study, we don't just read God's word, we study it so that we can handle the truth, so that we don't get caught up in divisions over what this prophecy means or that prophecy means. We don't quarrel over what foods we eat or what we don't eat or anything else. We get together on Jesus Christ is the reason. He is the reason that everything moves and has its being. And we are saved to proclaim salvation through Jesus Christ as though we were ambassadors. This was our mission, sit down in a foreign land. So it permeates how we live. But we study so that we don't get caught up in false doctrines. Because false doctrines, believe it or not, are preached in the church still today just like they were preached. And you read them in the letters to the different churches then. And they're meant, whether or not the people even know it, to do it to distract you. To keep you from your focus of being the hands and feet in Jesus in this world. So I want you to think about those seven letters. I want you to think about, and that's what I told you to do last week, those seven letters written to you and I. Because if we let Christ examine our hearts, we're going to find places where we fall short. And if we fall short, then we need to come lay it at the cross. We don't ever need to pick it up again. And we need to repent and hear the words of the Spirit and obey. Plain and simple. I was going to get a bunch of rocks today and give you each a rock, but I decided not to just to protect myself. Because <laughs> I'm going to say some things today that you might say, well, I'm going to throw a rock at him. I find that offensive. I'm not teaching a doctrine or anything else, okay? You want to know what I believe? I might tell you what I believe and what I might not believe. And guess what? What I believe today might be different than what I believed yesterday about these future events, okay? I am no expert at those. But I do try to study to be an approved workman that rightly handles the word of truth. So I'm not handing out any rocks yet. But I want to get, quote you some scripture. Romans 13, and you don't need to turn there because I'm going to be going pretty fast. But if you want to be turning somewhere, we're going to study Revelation, right? So turn to Matthew chapter 24. Okay, you can go ahead and be turning there. In Romans 13, and do this, understanding the occasion. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber, for your salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. This sounds very similar to the words that we're reading in uh, Revelation. The night is nearly over, the day has drawn near. So let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light, not our armor, God's armor. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Well, when I look at those things, I want to say I don't do much of them, but if I really examine myself, maybe I do. Okay? Instead, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the desires of the flesh. So if I want to walk in step with the Spirit, I've got to let the Spirit reveal all truth to me. I've got to be studying His Word. I've got to be spending time with God's people. I've got to be praying. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold resolutely to the hope that we profess. For he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how to spur one another on to what? Action, love, and good deeds. Let us not neglect meeting together, as some have made the habit, but let us encourage all, each other all the more. And all the more as you see that the day is approaching. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received the knowledge of the truth, no further sacrifice for sin remains, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of a raging fire that will consume all adversaries. Now I'm thinking of those letters to the seven churches, and I'm thinking about how they apply to myself, and I'm thinking that God's wrath is coming. I have an urgency to tell people about salvation through Jesus Christ. Other things in my life should not matter, even in comparison. And Jesus said, if your love for me is not greater than your love for your father and mother and everything, then you don't really love me. And if you put your hand to the plow and longingly look back, you don't deserve the kingdom of heaven. Instead, if anyone wants to be my disciple, he must deny himself. He must take up his cross daily, and he must follow after me. That's what you must do 
if in fact you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 24. A lot of insight here into the book of Revelation. Yes, you can go back and study Daniel. You can go back and study other things. But let's look how Jesus addressed his disciples about the things that were coming soon. Okay? As Jesus left the temple and was walking away, his disciples came up to him to point out the, its buildings. Do you see all these things? Jesus said, Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. While Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. They were bewildered. They were confused. Wait a minute. You are here. You are the Messiah. We have this beautiful temple over here. You're supposed to come and free us from Roman oppression. What in the world are you talking about, about this temple is going to be destroyed? That was the craziest thing that they would ever hear, especially since Jesus was here leading them in person. And remember, Jesus is going to be going away. He's got, going to give the promise to the Holy Spirit to you, and you will be His hands and feet. You will be His witnesses to the ends of the earth. <clears throat> Tell us, they said, when will these things happen, and what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? Two specific questions, and Jesus answers them both. And as you're reading this, it's hard to determine what is future, future prophecy and what's here and, and which ones apply to each because they're intertwined. They're intertwined with Old Testament prophecy. And you can be an expert all you want to, but you're not going to know all the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. I don't care how much you study and everything. And the more that you think you know, that's probably the further you are for actually from the truth because you're relying on your own self rather than God to reveal it to you. Okay? So saying all this, Jesus answered, See to it that no one deceives you. That's how he started off. His disciples of that day were saying, Hey, when is this destruction coming? And tell us about the coming, your second coming. And he said, Don't let anyone deceive you. So that ought to be the same today. Don't let people deceive you with all of these end times revelations and everything else. Stay focused on the mission. I'm a soldier for Jesus Christ. I'm in the Lord's army and I'm focusing on that and you're coming with me and I want to bring you along and as, as Hebrew says, as you fall down, you pick, I pick you up and as I fall down, you pick me up and we run this race with perseverance and we throw away anything that entangles us. And that's what we're here to do. See that no one deceives you for many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars but see to it that you are not alarmed. These things must happen but the end is still to come. Don't lose your faith. Persevere. Nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginnings of birth pain. Not the pregnancy, but when the pains come, when the delivery is going to come soon. And the pains intensify as it gets closer to birth. But man, is it worth it. Right, ladies that have had a baby? I wouldn't know, so I have to go to you. I don't understand that pain versus the joy. I understand the joy, but I didn't have to go through the pain so much. Ask Sherry, because she went through a long labor. And you ask her, literally ask her. Because when oh, they were about 12 hours into it or however far into it, this is getting ridiculous, my point of view. When is this going to be over? Come on, Sherry. <laughs> Not the thing you say to your wife when she's in labor. Not remotely is the thing that you say. Okay, but when the end comes, there's celebration. Verse 9, Then <clears throat> they will deliver you over to be persecuted and killed, and you will be hated by all nations. That's when the birth pains are there. And you'll be hated because of my name, because of your faith and your actions. At that time, many will fall away and will betray and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and mislead many. Because of the multiplication of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who perseveres to the end will be saved. Sounds a lot like Revelation. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a testimony to all nations. That's your job. And then the end will come. Your job is to preach, to be a light to this world. And then however the end comes, it will come. If you concentrate more on studying the Beatitudes and the blessings there rather than trying to figure out Revelation, you probably would be inspired to live a better life as a Christian. 1 Timothy 4. Paul is writing to Timothy, his beloved disciple. 
But reject, verse 7, irre irreverent, silly myth. Instead, train yourself for godliness. I spoke about this a few weeks ago. This actual training that you've got to do of pushing yourself. And the way to build muscle is you literally work your muscle so hard that you tear your muscle. It, it grows back. It grows back bigger and stronger. That's how it works. You do the same thing with your faith, with your studying, everything else. You train yourself for godliness. The more effort you put into it, the more effort you're going to get out of it because you're going to be walking in step with the Spirit. It's not what you're doing again, but you have to put in the effort to get the response that God's going to give to you. I'll say it this way to explain it again. If you're reading God's Word, and I did this down at the, the journey. If you're reading God's Word and you say, I just, I just don't understand it. Well, it's a love letter to you girls. I, I, I see that and, and, and everything, but I just don't understand it. Well, then I folded up a love letter from me, and I folded up a love letter from Dusty. Some of the girls fell in love with Dusty. Not me. Who cares about me? You know, it's not about Dusty's either. They hear the Word of God. But I handed out that love letter to him. I said, you're struggling reading this because it's a love letter and you just don't understand it. And the girl took the love letter and started opening up Dusty's just like I knew she would. And I said, they say exactly the same thing, sweetheart. Slow down. Oh, okay. I said, but Dusty's means more to you, don't it? Yeah. I said, so you're going to hang on to those words, cling those words, hold them close to your heart because Dusty wrote them instead of Alan. And she goes, ah, ha, 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 ha. I get it. When you read God's word that way, because of the love he's given you through Jesus Christ, the great salvation you have, then these words are going to come more alive to you. You are going to respond more to them. The more the Holy Spirit's going to work through you. Don't worry about, uh, let's see how he wrote it here, irreverent, silly myths. We don't know the hours or the seasons. That's the last thing Jesus said to his disciples before he left to go to heaven. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. That's what we need to concentrate on. <clears throat> Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, Paul's about to die for the gospel, and he says, join me in suffering. Jesus said not to be surprised when you suffer. He said, sufferings you will have. The gospels are full of it. Why would John's revelation be any different? It's written to seven physical churches about the suffering that they're going to go through. Join me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. A soldier refrains from entangling himself in civilian affairs in order to please the one who enlisted him. Likewise, a competitor does not receive the crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to partake in the crops. Consider what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all things. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David, and is proclaimed by my gospel, for which I suffer to the extent of being chained like a criminal. But the word of God cannot be chained. For this reason I endure all things for the sake of the elect, so that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This is trustworthy saying, if we died with him, we also live with him. If we endure... We will also reign with him. Boy, I'm thinking of scripture from Revelation. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. For he cannot deny himself. Remind the believers of these things, charging them before God to avoid quarreling over words, which succeeds only in leading the listeners to ruin. Make every effort to present yourself approved to God, an unashamed workman who accurately handles the word of truth. Did you know those verses were before 2 Timothy 2.15? But avoid, and then he goes back to it again, irreverent, empty chatter, which only lead to more ungodliness. We're supposed to train to godliness, but worrying about these myths and different things, which there's a lot of different ideas out there. I'll put that word, ideas, about the things to come. Train to godliness instead. Back to Matthew 24 and Jesus' words. I'm in verse 15. So when you see, standing in the holy place, the abomination of desolation, okay, now we're getting into these things, described by the prophet Daniel. Which one? Described by the prophet Daniel. Are we referring to Daniel 9.27? Are we referring to Daniel 11.31? Are we referring to Daniel 12.11? Are these three times that Daniel refers to, are these the same event? Are these three different events? Two events? Are these the only three events? Or are, these, are there ten events in these three he's talked about? Okay. 
<clears throat> let the reader understand, verse 16, then let those who are in Judea, okay, now we're getting specific, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop come down to retrieve anything from his house, and let no one in the field return for his cloak. How miserable those days will be for pregnant and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not occur, occur in the winter, because weather would be bad, or on the Sabbath, because you'd be restricted by how much you could travel. For at that time, okay, we're specifically talking about what Jesus is talking about here, there will be a great tribulation. Not just a tribulation, but the word great is there in the Scripture. Unmatched from the beginning of the world until now and never seen and will never be seen again. And though, if those days had not been cut short, nobody would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, and there he is, do not believe it. Two specific questions asked and a specific answer. This is specifically relating to prophecy in Daniel, which is specifically relating to people in Judea when this great tribulation is going to come. Now, hindsight, you know, hindsight makes things clear, right? <laughs> All the time. I can think of many things right now that have nothing to do with the Bible that I should have had better hindsight about. Is Jesus referring to the destruction of the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70? Probably. Because that event soon happened, and Jesus said these things would happen, and they're pretty specific on the destruction of the temple. But wait a minute. This says that um, there is this great tribulation is unmatched from the beginning of the world until now. Well, let's think about it. He's talking to his disciples again. And if we look at the destruction of God's people, then what happened in A.D. 70 was very, very, very specific, and it wiped out the nation of Israel until the, the 19, whatever it was, 57? 48. 48. Yes, there's other things in history, but as far as the Jewish nation and the people, this was never seen before anything like that. Maybe that's the case. Maybe it's not. I'm not preaching to you again about facts of different things. But this sure looks specific to the, to the disciples, to that day, to the destruction that happened in A.D. 70. And Jesus used the words, great tribulation, not just tribulation. Because so many things in Revelation, wait a minute, we're talking about the great tribulation. Okay? For false Christs and false prophets will appear... That's what we've seen since the beginning of the church, and that's what we still see today. They were inside the church, and the letters were constantly being written by James and Peter and Paul. Get this out of your church. And perform great signs and wonders that will, would deceive even the elect if that were possible. See, I have told you these things in advance. I'm going to put a number out there, and don't hold me to it. I think 99% chance that they, Jesus is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in the temple in A.D. 70. You may disagree with me, and that is fine. That is perfectly fine for you to do that. I want you to go back and study God's Word. I want you to read Matthew 24 and see how it relates to you and the reason that Jesus said the words that He said. Don't fear. Suffering will come. You will be martyred for your witness. The word is the same. For your testimony of me. Don't be surprised. That's why I told you you'd have to take, deny yourself and take up your cross and follow after me. And if you are faithful and if you persevere, you will overcome and you will be rewarded for it. So we don't have to know all the details. We need to know what we're called to do. Verse 26, so I tell you, there he is in the wilderness. Do not go out. Here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For just as lightning comes from the east and flashes as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now we're talking about the coming of the Son of Man. The second question, wherever there is a carcass, wherever there, is a carcass there the vultures will gather. Two specific questions. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, so maybe Jesus is answering the second question now, maybe some things are still intertwined again. The sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. At that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heaven. Okay. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. They will mourn more than likely because the time has come and there is no time to turn to Him anymore. 
and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heaven to the other. Sounds just like some verses that I can refer you to in Revelation, but I'm not. Where is the church? Have they been raptured? Does it matter? Is it pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib? Or is the job of the church to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ until that day? Why would we want to worry about and quarrel about and get divided over these things when we have a mission to do? It's just so sad that the thing that divides so many Christians so much is God's Word and how they want to relate that to these trivial things. Rather than Jesus died, rose again, I will be forever with Him. How can I not live my life as an, as an example and a witness to Jesus Christ? In Revelation 1, verse 9, I, John, your brother, and partner in the tribulation, what they're going through at that time, and kingdom, tribulation and kingdom, they go hand in hand, and perseverance that, it, that are in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God. That's where he's exiled because of that. And my testimony about Jesus. On the Lord's day I was in spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Seven real churches. In chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, I know your affliction and your poverty. Poverty, though you are rich, and I am aware of the slander of those who falsely claim to be Jews, but are in fact a synagogue of Satan. Just like the Pharisees that Jesus said woe to in his days, the same thing is still going on here. The church is being persecuted by Jews, not by the Romans at this point. They're being persecuted by people who say they believe, but don't really believe. <clears throat> they re deny Jesus Christ. Verse 10, do not fear what you're about to suffer. Look, the devil is about to throw you into prison to test you, and you will suffer tribulation for ten days. Be faithful even unto death, and I will give you crown, the crown of life. I just read about those same words in Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse 12, Because of the multiplication of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. <clears throat> but the one who perseveres to the end will be saved. And in verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached... In, in all the world as a testimony of all nations, and then the end will come. That sounds a lot like the letter to the first church in Ephesus and the letter to the church, second church in Smyrna. The third church, Pergamon, Jesus says, He is the one who holds the sharp double-edged sword, the word of God, and will wage war against them with the sword of His mouth. So repent, and you'll be given a new name. The fourth church was Thyatira in Revelation 2.21. We read, Even though I have given her time to repent of her immorality, she is unwilling. Behold, I will cast her into a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her will suffer great tribulation. The word great is there, unless they repent of their deeds. So what have I got to focus from here again? I need to be set apart in this world like Christ, and anything that I'm falling short on, let me turn to Jesus and buy the things that I need so that I can see clearly, so that I can hear and understand and obey, because the time is drawing near. The fifth church was Sardis. You think you're alive, but you're dead. The sixth church, Philadelphia, loving God and loving others. Hey, that's the way to be. The seventh church, Laodicea. Well, I'm lukewarm about my faith. Blech. Jesus will spit you out of his mouth. Repent before it's too late. Revelation chapter 4, after this, John saw the throne room in heaven, and he tries to describe it, tries to describe it. How in the world can I describe heavenly things? There's no way that I can come close, except that the Spirit of God gave words to John that could barely describe the, the beauty and the awesomeness of heaven and what the future glory will be like. Revelation chapter 5, then John sees a scroll, and who can unroll it? Jesus, that's who, the Lamb of God, the one who was slain, and we are supposed to walk in this world to the point of being slain for the gospel message. Why wouldn't we? Jesus did. Heavenly beings break out into worship and praise. Revelation chapter 6, the Lamb opens the first of six seals. If you don't understand that, it's a parchment and it's sealed up and you break the seal and you read until you hit another seal. And sometimes you've got to be somebody of higher status than broke this seal to break this seal. Jesus could open them all and then we can get to see more things revealed. So we go through the first six. 
And the fifth seal was opened, and the martyrs, or the souls, are under the altar, and they cry out, asking, How much longer? Then each is given a white robe. Oh, I'm thinking back to the letters to written to the churches again. And told to wait a little longer. Oh, I'm thinking about the letter to written to the real churches again. Until the full number of servants of God are killed. Whether that takes 2,000 years or 20,000 years for that to happen. I don't know. <clears throat> but till the full number of God's servants are killed. Killed for their testimony. And remember, in the seventh letter, when Jesus writes to the lukewarm church, he tells them to buy those white robes, to purchase those from him. Revelation chapter 7, After this, after the first six seals and what happens in those seals, after this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. Do you remember where I just read that from Matthew? About four angels at the four corners of the earth? They're holding back the four winds so that no wind would blow on land or sea or any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east with the seal of the living God. And he called out with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and sea. Wait! Wait, because the full number hasn't come yet. This destruction will come, but wait. Do not harm the land or sea until we have sealed the foreheads of the servants of God. Back to Matthew 24. When will these things happen, and what will be the sign of the Son of Man? And I'm reading continually through. Verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give us light. The star will fall from the sky, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. At that time, the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds uh, of heaven with great power, with power and great glory. He will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the heavens to the earth. I've been reading, I've read that before, don't get confused, but I've been reading an order from Matthew 24 about those questions. So I ask again, where is the church now? Have they been raptured, not raptured? And I'm simply asking those questions so you don't worry about them. <laughs> it doesn't really matter, does it? Are they the ones that come out of this great tribulation? What is this great tribulation? Back to Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. After this I looked and saw a multitude too large to count from every nation and tribe and people and tongue. Isn't this what it's about? Standing before the throne and before the Lamb, they were wearing white robes. They purchased them. And they were holding palm branches. Now I'm taking back to when Jesus came in to Jerusalem and they were waving palm branches saying, Hosanna, King of kings, save us now. But they, they didn't want the salvation that Jesus was offering because he's offering, if a man wants to be my disciple, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow after me. They wanted immediately to be saved from the tribulation that would be coming to them and didn't even know about it. Verse 10, they cried out a loud voice, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell face down before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, These in white robes, he asked, Who are they and where have they come from? Sir, I answered, you know. So he replied, these are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. Huh. Certainly they're not just the ones that come out of this seven-year tribulation that I've been talked about. Certainly they're people that come out of this tribulation period because they have proclaimed the name of Jesus Christ and have suffered for it. Whether they suffered unto death because people persecuted them or they suffered by giving up some of their riches and authority in their own lives in a free country. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's how I get that white robe. For this reason they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And the one seated on the throne will spread His tabernacle, His dwelling over them. Never again will they hunger, never will they thirst, nor will the sun beat down upon them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb is the center of the th in the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The purpose is to draw people into the throne room of God where we will worship and praise Him forever. Now that doesn't mean, again, 
the, some of the things that you've been taught or not taught that we're just going to sit in, on clouds and play harps, okay? <laughs> it means that we've been saved and put back into a right relationship with Jesus Christ and with God forever and ever and ever. Amen. Now mankind joins in the celebration of heaven in the throne room of God, being saved through tribulation. Now you take that and you put it however you mean it, especially as you're reading the rest of Revelation. Because every time I go to Revelation, so many people want to dive off on these things, even to the point of division. And they come to the point where you know, we won't even talk about Revelation. But Jesus wrote <laughs> Revelation so that the churches would see that they should endure, to see what they're doing wrong so that they would repent and buy from Him, so that even if they're saved, because some of those churches probably aren't saved, but even if they're saved, they won't live a life wasted, but instead live a life of worth and have a difference in people. Now get your rocks ready. They're imaginary. <coughs> Okay. When did G John write this letter? Ooh, that's going to have a big difference on what you think. But why should it? Tradition has it that John wrote this from the island of Patmos somewhere around A.D. 90. But do you know what church tradition also says that it was written before that in about A.D. 68? Wow, if it was written in A.D. 68, then that could very well point to a lot of these things that he's talking about happened in A.D. 70. If he wrote it in A.D. 90, no, it's already happened. But the strange thing about him writing in A.D. 90, we get it both from, from tradition, is that no New Testament author mentions the destruction of Jerusalem. Is that because that event had not happened yet? I don't know. And it does not matter. But if you knew that were a fact, you would look at Revelation totally differently than you probably looked at it before I said this. There's where the rocks come in. I was going to give you the biggest one. <laughs> because we've been trained all these things. But see, the problem that I have with the pre-trib rapture is I've heard all my life growing up in the South, well, I won't be here when that day comes. Well, you know, if you won't be here when that day comes, you probably won't be here the day that it comes today and you're still here you'll probably deny Jesus Christ because we're called to suffer. And if you don't understand that, you'll never give him your heart fully because is he not worth suffering and dying for? Is there anything any greater than the salvation that has been given to you through Jesus Christ our Lord? If you believe in your heart and profess in your, with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, not Savior, that's, it doesn't say Savior in that ver ver verse. Everything the Bible teaches you is to obey Jesus Christ, to live for Him no matter what the cost. And His last words to the church here before He left was, you don't need to know the things of this world, the times or the seasons that God has planned, but you do need to know that you're my witness, and without the power of the Holy Spirit, you will not be my witness. You've got to let the Holy Spirit transform you and change you. And then Jesus from heaven wrote a letter very similar saying, Here's the good things you're doing. Here's the bad things you're doing. Get rid of the bad things. Repent and persevere in your suffering because you will be saved through it. And it will be worth it. So as you continue to read Revelation, and I know you read Revelation chapter 8 already, but I'll speak about it next time. Look at the those letters that are written. Look at how you're living your life. Do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, with everything of your being? And are you loving others because it has changed you and you can't help but love that way? So that not only will you give up a weekend and travel for a journey, oh, that's so, so great, but so trivial in the scheme of things that that's what you give up, if, if that's what you want to mark down on a calendar, how you suffered. We're called to suffer every day. The early church gave up everything that it had thought before and lived a life where they sold the possessions they had because they said, we don't count them as ours. We count them as things that you have given us to be good to other people. And if we lived that kind of life, wouldn't we really, really be proclaiming the voice of God loudly? The biggest problem that Kim probably faced in the journey, and I'm not putting words in her mouth, 
was that we have got out of habit of meeting together as some do. We are facing that time where there's a falling away from Jesus. How much more do we need to be the voice and the light in this world proclaiming Jesus? Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this church. Lord, I thank you for the fact that you will never, ever forsake us and that Jesus is there as our advocate before the Father preparing our heavenly home. I thank you that the Spirit indwells us. Please, Lord, help us to increase our faith so that we hear the words of the Spirit, so that we don't get complacent, so we don't fear anything else in these worlds in these changing times. But give us boldness, as the first church prayed for, to proclaim the gospel message, even if it means being imprisoned, even if it means suffering, even if it means dying. Lord, may we be a light and a testimony, especially to our families, to our friends, and even to our enemies, as we proclaim the message of Jesus Christ. We pray this in His name. Amen.